Hi, everybody, and welcome back to AEG's podcast. Today, I've got my dear friend, Jeff, with VizWorks. I'm super stoked to introduce you to all the good work that he's doing, he and his team. And of course, he's been on a previous uh, podcast with me, so uh, we've got some history together. I'm delighted that you're here, Jeff. Likewise. So good to talk again, Catherine. I agree. Thank you. This works is celebrating its 11th anniversary this year. I can't believe it. Time flies. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the educational origins of it. Uh, so VizWorks is uh, originally conceived of by a cross-Canada research network headquartered at the University of Calgary. And the the idea that we came up with ultimately was how do we bring the, the advanced understanding of how to uh, enable transformation of data and and the background on this is that ultimately we gather a lot of data every industry gathers tremendous amounts of data but turning that data into something you can actually do something with is a challenge for a lot of uh, organizations and a lot of industries and so this idea of transforming data into information that information ultimately into knowledge wisdom and action you want to be able to do something with it that was kind of the roots of the research that was being done at the university that we ultimately spun out the company to focus on. So our underpinnings, our education, our focus is really on this presentation side of things. How do you enable people to understand data more clearly and in, in better details and, and make those good decisions as a result of that? And, and when I talk about data, I'm talking about data writ broadly. We're not talking about just numerical data. We're talking about three-dimensional information. We're talking about statistical information. We're talking about anything you can imagine that's considered to be digital information. How do you transform that into knowledge, wisdom, and action? That's what we do. So important. Data is the only action now, right? It's like so important. Well done. Yeah. It's key to everything, ultimately. And, you know, if, and we make a lot of decisions based on instinct and intuition and all the rest of it. But if that's not backed up by solid facts, solid data, uh, we can go off in paths that are perhaps not the best. So 100 percent. And I like that confirmation of data. You got, OK, I might have my own intuition on something, which, as you know, we've got our executive search firm, et cetera, or when I meet someone new. But I'd like to know the extra information that's available, too. Mm -hmm. Precisely. <laughs> and it's it. Yeah, we can go into a rabbit hole okay. there, but, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, absolutely. Ultimately, it's it's uh, we need to confirm that what we're talking about is actually realistic, uh, without getting into what's called confirmational bias, where we only select the facts that support our our predisposed decisions that we want to make. Um, and so, this ability to actually provide information that's generic and it's understandable in a broad sense, without forcing biases, is really important. You've touched on my next question, and maybe you've already answered. It. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go into it anyway. <laughs> How has BizWorks educational roots shaped the solutions it builds? So yes, in some ways, I've already covered that. But really, it's this idea that the um, unless you're informed, unless you actually understand the data you can't make good decisions around that data. And so the way, the variety of ways and the variety of technologies we use to help people with that understanding is kind of key. And that's really about education. That's about enabling people to understand things in ways that they wouldn't classically understand otherwise. And so ultimately that's all about education. It's all about informing. It's all about enabling people to get that deep understanding that allows them to make better decisions and, and adjusting their intuition, adjusting their understanding, their expectations so that they can make those good decisions ultimately. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, and, and certainly we can go into a lot of different application areas where we've been doing this and we've been doing this for years. Uh, but it's really that transformational process and generating understanding through education is, is kind of an underpinning of everything that we do. I love it. And and I think one of the applications is through the Canada Energy Regulator. Mm. And I'm interested in that work and, and how to improve energy literacy specifically. Yeah, that's a very interesting project. So that one, I think it's been going on a little over seven years uh, wow. working with what was the National Energy Board previously and now the Canada Energy Regulator. Uh, and this, it's all about energy literacy. It's all about this whole idea that as a as a, a regulatory agency, one of their mandates is informing the public around what's going on in the energy industry in Canada. Uh, and that shows up, in, of course, in a whole variety of ways from how we generate energy, how we use energy, how, you know, any challenges with things like pipelines, all these kind of things that they need to inform the public about. And we've been working with them for as a, just over seven years now in that whole area around energy literacy and, and education. Uh, and we're doing this through uh, highly interactive visualizations that are web-based visualizations. Um, there's a few different kind of key interesting aspects to these. 
One is that visualizations in and of themselves are very cool and they're custom designed for specific use cases to, to maximize the ability for people to understand what's going on. Uh, the interactive nature of them means that people can explore the data sets versus giving a pre-digested, here's how I want you to understand it. Um, you can explore it and come up with your own understanding because it's interactive. Uh, and in fact, if you look back to the history where this started, the National Energy Board um, classically would have presented this data in static charts, visualizations, tables of data for analysts to kind of analyze on their own. Uh, and the ability for the general public to engage was very limited in that. Mm -hmm. By working with us over the last seven years and in, in creating these highly interactive visualizations, now the general public can explore this data set quite easily on their own and can get these deep understandings on their own that they couldn't otherwise get. Um, and it was kind of interesting from the perspective that it started out with the idea of being public engagement. It also became things like policy decisions. So government officials using these internally within the National Energy Board and Canada and Australia itself, their decision makers were actually using these tools instead of the ones that they had because they were easier to understand. Mm -hmm. So the, the ability to really kind of move the needle forward has been tremendous in terms of energy literacy from the regulatory level in terms of this kind of tool set. Um, but the one other aspect, which is interesting from an education perspective is accessibility. So if you look at you know, their mandate, inform the public, well, the, the public has a variety of different capabilities when it comes to engaging with information. Most people generically are able to engage with visualizations and have no challenges, but some people are maybe colorblind. So therefore the choice of colors has to be done such that people who are colorblind can still see and understand these visualizations. Some people may have physical mobility challenges, which means that they're using a, an access device, which makes it more challenging for them to navigate websites. So the visualizations have to be structured around people who may have navigation, physical impairment issues. So, and of course, French and English. And it's really the idea that when you're doing these things, you have to look at not only kind of one demographic, but the broader demographic you actually want to engage and enable for people who may or may not have accessibility challenges as well. So, so this, these are designed with that full accessibility kind of perspective in mind. I love it. That is great. I didn't know that either. Thank you, Jeff. That's excellent. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and how do I pronounce, is it energy feel, energy file? Energy file, yes. Energy file. So tell us about that initiative and how the company is working with Peter Tostakian. So Peter's amazing. And yes. uh, many people will know him, of course, from the education that he does when it comes to the energy industry. And and, uh, and he's written, I think, a couple of best-selling books in the past. Uh, and back in 2017, I think it was, uh, we started talking about what he was doing and he realized that while it was wonderful to write a best-selling book, after about three months, it became a dust collector. Mm. There was a few reasons for that. One is that um, information is not static. And particularly when you have an industry like the energy industry, which is moving at a pace and evolving rapidly, anything you wrote a year ago may or may not be relevant to the world today. Okay. So the nature of kind of static knowledge and and physically putting something in a book has a very limited shelf life in terms of its actually meaningfulness to it. So he wanted something that was more dynamic. He wanted to kind of rethink the way that a book was designed and for educating people on the energy industry that was dynamic, interactive, and could be evolved over time as the nature of the energy industry evolved over time. Hmm. Uh, we also kind of, and, and kind of one of his insights in this is that people's attention spans are shorter too. They don't want to read an entire book. They want to read that snippet that's actually relevant to their context at that moment in time. So little vignettes, little context relevant kind of pieces of information are much more digestible than an entire book, which you have to read through to kind of get that one little snippet that you actually cared about at that time. So blending all these things together, we've jointly built a platform called Energy File. Uh, and so Energy File is Peter's initiative around using digital online platform technology to really enable better energy understanding, energy literacy, uh, and use it as a platform that can be dynamically evolved over time to change people's understanding and engagement with that energy industry. And of course, the war in Ukraine wasn't a good example of how literally within a very short period of time, energy security became one of the dominant concerns within the energy industry, whereas before it was a very limited concern because there was a happy, playful ground in terms of energy you know, engagement. And so, so the ability to now bring things around energy security into this dynamic environment made this a very easy platform to continue to build solutions and, and education around. And 
uh, and and the energy file and sorry the file space which is the, actually the underlying platform technology which is a it's a SaaS a web based kind of environment is now being utilized for multiple other educational purposes. So uh, University of Lethbridge as an example is using file space for uh, literacy around indigenous uh, matters and really helping people understand the indigenous cultures and and, and kind of concerns around indigenous peoples. Uh, there's other uh, institutes that are looking at bringing in energy literacy into the classroom for post-secondary institutes, uh, using file space and energy file as a platform for that. Heritage Park is using it for teaching people around energy and energy literacy in their innovation crossing building, but also using it to engage with their entire collection of artifacts across the entire uh, area of Heritage Park. Uh, there's museums that are using it. There's art galleries that are using it. There's photographers using it. There's, you know, the government of Alberta, Alberta Innovates is using it for describing all the projects they're supporting. It's kind of growing quite dramatically in terms of a platform for educational purposes. Hmm, love it. Okay, well, I think you've just answered my next question too. Um, the future of education. I think that's, that is firstly the first steps to that. Is there, where do you see this happening in the next five, 10 years? What does that look like? So, yeah, so this is one of the things that we find very interesting right now is that education writ large is changing dramatically. The role of educational institutions within the educational environment is also changing dramatically. We saw, of course, with chat GPT when that came out most recently. It made a lot of organizations kind of rethink how we're doing education because now a lot of their methodologies around testing were based upon, you know, write an essay and give me the results and I'm going to judge your, your knowledge based on the essay. Well, mm -hmm. if chat GPT can now generate that very quickly for me, I'm, do I really know that? Do I not know that? So the way we teach, the way we actually make sure we understand whether somebody has grasped the context and the concepts is evolving from a post-secondary perspective with the evolution of technologies like chat GPT. Um, but even more so, the, the role of a post-secondary institute in the educational realm is evolving itself. Uh, there's so much information out there on the web now. You can go and you can find anything you want to know about is on the web. And, and you know, we see this from the, if I want to actually, you know, take apart that motorcycle and then repair that engine on a motorcycle, I could probably find a YouTube video that tells me exactly how to do that. I don't need to go to course and figure that out no. I can look at it online and I can go through and do those exact steps on it right okay. so just in time education that's widely available and easily accessible is totally changing the way we engage with and access educational materials so how does a post-secondary play into that role well they have facilities they have physical locations they have methodologies around teaching that enable a deeper understanding their role their understanding of how that they blend educational materials and facilities and all this kind of stuff together is evolving in context with the wide availability of educational material that's out there mm -hmm. what i love about that too is the inclusivity inclusivity of the learning, because I know myself, I was very ADD, although never diagnosed, I know I am, and my whole family knows I am. If I would have had that opportunity to learn differently, I know I would have had a different experience through school. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of kids out there that probably feel that way. So I think this is exciting and very inclusive for everyone. Absolutely. Well, there's an initiative here in Calgary called the Learning City Collective which is focused on exactly this idea of completely changing the way we think about education and the fact that most learning opportunities are not coming from classic post-secondaries, at least for the adult population. They're coming through all these kind of little piecemeal type of approaches and we're not really recognizing the value of that. You know, they're recognizing the value that I now know how to pull apart a motorcycle motor if I'm doing that. Not that I've done that recently, but you know, but you know, the idea that you know, I have a new skill that I didn't have before, that I didn't learn through a classic kind of approach to this. This is really the opportunity that we have right now to not only recognize it, but promote and support and and find ways to integrate all these things together to create higher levels of skills and knowledge. Agreed. And this is where Peter Peter Diamandis and all their good work, Singularity University, are is saying, has been saying for many years, now it's going to be exponential. The opportunity for all of us is going to be exponential. Yeah, How about the, the flip sorry, side, go ahead. I was to say the flip side of that, and this is where the challenge comes in, is that we're going to get overwhelmed, which we probably already are, but we're going to get overwhelmed with the potentials of what's out there. How do we find the ones that are actually valuable to us? Bite size. <laughs> well, it's, it's bite size, but you know, if I was to do a search for any particular educational topic, 
I can almost guarantee I'm going to find, you know, 10, 100 different kind of things on that particular topic, which is the right one for me. I don't want to jump into one. I get halfway through it and realize oh, that's not going anywhere where it's really valuable to me. So this ability to actually understand what's really relevant to us amongst the myriad of educational opportunities that we have available to us is also going to be key as we move forward. Back to our first part of our conversation with intuition, data, and referencing. <laughs> Organizing, presenting, and engaging, and understanding all that stuff. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you, yeah. Jeff. And how about some of the examples that BizWorks supplies around addressing educational challenges? Do you have a couple that you could share? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously the ones that we talked about already with regards yeah. to uh, file space and energy file and, and CR, uh, we're working right now with a medical doctor around developing uh, virtual reality based training for eye doctors. So wow. how to actually train people on doing surgery on the eye in virtual reality. So wow. a wonderful example of using this and haptic feedback devices to have precise motor control and, and enabling, you know, uh, an ability for them to do that surgery on the eye while it's a virtual eye, not before they get to a physical eye, because most people don't want a student learning on their eyes. Yeah, so warning, start. don't do this at home. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, so this ability to actually train again and again and again and try it and try it and try it until you have got it perfected before you actually work on a physical person um, is what virtual reality is really going to enable in that particular case. Um, there's another one working with the Calgary Fire Department around fire safety education, mm -hmm. enabling uh, the Calgary Fire Department, which classically goes out and teaches in a classroom environment, you know, fire safety concepts, to do this in virtual reality and enable people to get a much, much deeper understanding of what it is to deal with a grease fire in your kitchen, as an example, mm -hmm. um, because it's contextually relevant. And, and so if you look at learning and retention of learning material, Classic classroom-based approaches get you maybe up to 20% retention rates. Mm -hmm. Experiential learning like virtual reality learning can get you into the 70 to 75% retention rates. Mm -hmm. The ability for people to not only understand it, but retain it over a longer period of time and, and be able to actually do it if they ever run into that situation themselves is really, really important. Sure. Uh, and we're seeing other scenarios, particularly in industrial commercial context, where what we, what we refer to as rare instant critical impact scenarios where, you know, you're standing in front of a boiler that's about to explode. What do you do? Well, you don't want to be standing in front of an actual physical boiler. that's about to yeah. explode because you're probably going to be dead. Right. I'd rather have that as the virtual reality training scenario where you can actually experience what it's like to be in that scenario, in that environment, trying to make the right moves and practicing until you get that move exactly right so that you can avoid the situation or at least, contain the situation before you're ever and hopefully never in front of that physical situation in the real world. So this rare instant critical impact is one of the big areas where virtual reality based scenario training is really becoming important. And we're seeing that show up in a lot of different cases. I love it. That's so good. I love hearing this. How about the intersection between energy literacy and digital education? Any of the challenges or opportunities that you see? Yeah. So the, um, energy literacy by and large because energy is evolving at such a rapid pace around the world and the impact of solar and and wind versus oil versus natural gas it's a massively complex environment right now and and one of the things i find in general is that we classically particularly in the petroleum industry have been reactive to educational requirements versus proactive to these educational requirements and, and one of the things that digital literacy or digital technologies enable us is to actually get ahead of the curve, be proactive mm -hmm. around informing people, be proactive as well as uh, enabling people to understand that the energy is a system. It's, you know, you've got many, many different kinds of sources of energy that are out there. You have many, many processes to transform that energy into other useful things from the perspective of the consumers. And then you have many, many different ways that that's consumed as a result of that. That enablement is something that I think we've had a lack of understanding of, and digital technologies will really allow us to understand that better. Agreed. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Future of energy literacy opportunities, would you like BizWorks to support? I really see that the kind of things we do and particularly the kind of ways that we present information and enable that engagement, that interactive capability for people to dive in and explore 
uh, is something that can counter a lot of the myths and disinformation challenges that we have out there. And this kind of comes back to the last question around what are the challenges. The challenge of a widely available digital world is that either deliberately or accidentally, we can get a lot of myths and disinformation that are out there as well. And so how do we actually enable people to understand where that's actually not perhaps quite correct uh, and get that detailed knowledge, that deeper understanding that they need to have to make good decisions? This is where VizWorks really can play a role in the future as we move forward in this, because the kind of stuff we do is really around that enablement of domain expertise translated into educational solutions for people. Uh, and so, you know, any of these areas where we can inform people, we can engage people, we can provide these highly interactive visualizations or immersive environments or whatever it happens to be to enable that, uh, that literacy, that understanding uh, is, is areas where we want to work and we want to support groups that are doing things in that space. I love it, Jeff. And what I also know about you is that you're a true collaborator. So you're always looking for opportunities to lift people up and organizations. So thank you for all the good work that you do for Alberta and beyond. My pleasure. And uh, yes, and let's, let's keep doing more. I mean, we have so many opportunities right now for everybody. And yes, we love to partner. We love to collaborate. We love to work together to improve the world. So let's let's do it. I love it. Thank you, Jeff. Everyone, that's Jeff with, with BizWorks. Please reach out to him directly, or if you need an introduction, I'm happy to make that happen. Thank you again for joining us on AEG's podcast.